The Discourses of Epictetus, Book 1, Chapter 4 of Progress. He who is making progress, having learned of the philosophers that desire is for things good and aversion is towards things evil, and having also learned that serenity and calm are not attained by a man save as he succeeds in securing the objects of desire and as he avoids encounters with the objects of aversion. Such a one has utterly excluded desire from himself or else deferred it to another time and feels aversion only towards the things which involve freedom of choice. For if he avoids anything that is not a matter of free choice, he knows that sometime he will encounter something in spite of his aversion to it and will come to grief. Now, if it is virtue that holds out the promise, thus to create happiness and calm and serenity, then assuredly progress towards virtue is progress towards each of these states of mind. For it is always true that whatsoever the goal towards which perfection in anything definitively leads, progress is an approach thereto. How comes it, then, that we acknowledge virtue to be a thing of this sort, and yet seek progress and make a display of it in other things? What is the work of virtue? Serenity. Who then is making progress? The man who has read many treaties of Chrysippus? What is virtue no more than this, to have gained a knowledge of Chrysippus? For if it is this, progress is confessedly nothing else than a knowledge of many of the works of Chrysippus. But now, while acknowledging that virtue produces one thing, we are declaring that the approach to virtue, which is progress, produces something else. So and so, says someone, is already able to read Chrysippus by himself. It is fine headway by the gods that you are making, men. Great progress, this. Why do you mock him? And why do you try to divert him from consciousness of his own shortcomings? Are you not willing to show him the work of virtue? That he may learn where to look for his progress? Look for it there, wretch, where your work lies. And where is your work? in desire and aversion, that you may not miss what you desire and encounter what you would avoid, in choice and in refusal, that you may commit no faults therein, in giving and withholding assent of judgment, that you may not be deceived. But first come the first and most necessary points. Yet if you are in a state of fear and grief, when you seek to be proof against encountering what you would avoid, how, pray, are you making progress? Do you yourself show me, therefore, your own progress in matters like the following. Suppose, for example, that in talking to an athlete, I said, show me your shoulders. And then he answered, look at my jumping weights. Go to you and your jumping weights. What I want to see is the effect of the jumping weights. Take the treatise upon choice and see how I have mastered it. It is not that I am looking into you slave, but how you act in your choices and refusals, your desires and aversions how you go at things and apply yourself to them, and prepare yourself, whether you are acting in harmony with nature therein, or out of harmony with it. For if you are acting in harmony, show me that, and I will tell you that you are making progress. But if out of harmony, be gone, and do not confine yourself to expounding your books, but go and write some of the same kind yourself. And what will you gain thereby? Do you not know that the whole book costs only five denarii? Is the expounder of it then? think you worth more than five denarii and so never look for your work in one place and your progress in another where then is progress if any man among you withdrawing from his external things has turned his attention to the question of his own moral purpose cultivating and perfecting it so as to make it finally harmonious with nature elevated free unhindered untrammeled faithful and honorable and if he has learned that he who craves or shuns the things that are not under his control can be neither faithful nor free, but must himself of necessity be changed and tossed to and fro with them, and must end by subordinating himself to others, those, namely, who are able to procure or prevent these things that he craves or shuns, and if finally when he rises in the morning he proceeds to keep and observe all this that he has learned, if he bathes as a faithful man, eats as a self-respecting man. Similarly, whatever the subject matter may be with which he has to deal, putting into practice his guiding principles, as the runner does when he applies the principles of running, and the voice trainer when he applies the principles of voice training, this is the man who in all truth is making progress, and the man who has not traveled at random is this one. But if he has striven merely to attain the state which he finds in his books, and works only at that, 
and has made that the goal of his travels. I bid him go home at once, and not neglect his concerns there, since the goal to which he has traveled is nothing. But not so the, that other goal, to study how a man may rid his life of sorrows and lamentations, of such cries as, Woe is me, and Wretch that I am, and of misfortune and failure, and to learn the meaning of death, exile, prison, hemlock, that he may be able to say in prison, Dear Crito, if so it pleases the gods, so be it. Rather than, alas, poor me, an old man, it is for this that I have kept my gray hairs. Who says such things? Do you think that I will name you some man held in small esteem and of low degree? Does not Priam say it? Does not Oedipus? Nay, all kings say it. For what are tragedies but the portrayal in tragic verse of the sufferings of men who have admired things external? If indeed one has to be deceived into learning that among things external and independent of our free choice, none concern us, I, for my part, should consent to a deception which would result in my living thereafter serenely and without turmoil. But as for you, you will see yourself deceived to your own preferences. What then does Chrysippus furnish us? That you may know, he says, that these things are not false from which serenity arises, and that tranquility comes to us, Take my books, and you shall know how conformable and harmonious with nature are the things which render me tranquil. O oh, the great good fortune! O oh, the great benefactor who points the way! To Triptolemus, indeed, all men have established shrines and altars, because he gave us as food the fruits of cultivation. But to him who has discovered, and brought to light, imparted to all men the truth which deals, not with mere life, but with a good life, who among you for that set up an altar in his honor? or dedicated a temple, or a statue, or bows down to God in gratitude for him. But because the gods have given us the wine, or the wheat, for that do we make sacrifice. And yet, because they have brought forth such fruit in a human mind, whereby they propose to show us the truth touching happiness, shall we fail to render thanks unto God for this? 